today on the bench and already opened up because I've been fighting recording tools. I have a Holocrafters HP or HPW1, uh, depending on whether you have the kit, power supply, low voltage, fairly high current, and I want to use it for a variety of things, especially testing motors and RC cars. But got to replace a few things first. Now originally, and I have some footage on this, but it's completely mute, so we'll see if that ends up in here. Anyways, the original line cord was left in, and a new one was just added with screw nuts. And the way that this is set up, the voltage that it actually outputs now is significantly higher than what it was rated for. Um, there's a sticker on top, and that was like the guy who I got it from at a garage sale. He tested it, and it goes up to about 30 volts now. And this capacitor is not rated for that. So, I'm going to swap that out for this wonderful piece of Vichy capacitance. Uh, 10,000 and 40 volts. So, it only goes up to about 32. And uh, you can reproduce that in a sim. I'll post all the schematics for that. And, uh, yeah, it's completely reproducible. Um, on the front here, it says the high range is 0 to 16, the low range is 0 to 8. And that's not the case anymore. And it's just the way it's built. So, get that. I'm not going to do anything to adjust that. Um, I think the diodes on the side here, they're pretty hefty, and they have good heat sinks. So I'm not too worried about them. But the capacitor, rub it off here, it's only rated up to 25. So running that at 32 is probably not the best idea. I don't want a big pile of fire, at least not in here. RC trucks have a habit of doing that all on their own already. So luckily, this thing was just screw terminaled in and has a big clamp at the bottom. Um, super dusty. Just absolutely nasty in here. I need to clean this whole thing out, but we'll see if that happens today or not. I don't want to soak down the transformers. There's one on top, and then there's a choke on the bottom, and I don't really want to get those wet. So, at the moment, I need to get this screw clamp open. Some kind of coat on the bottom. I don't really know much about what that means. Sprag, so it's actually going to be replaced with something fairly close, possibly a descendant. And one of these is probably a date code or some component, maybe even the 63. I think these things were made in the 60s. It says, there's a little bit of writing on the top, 45 and factory wired. I'm pretty sure it was not made in 45. Um, I looked these up, and I believe they were sold in the early 60s, both as a complete unit and as a kit, so you could get it, take it home, and set it yourself. The manual has instructions on how to do that. So pull those out. And this thing is going to need some screw terminals because it doesn't have any yet. Way, way smaller than the original. I've got a few other components I want to add as well. Um, so this, I'm not sure what I'm going to do to attach it long term. Probably see if these will bend safely. Spiders are kind of nasty, but not too bad. Uh, and the single one was the negative, and this apparently, so the negative is labeled, and then the next one you want is actually this number one, and then two and three can either be connected to ground or left out entirely, uh, not connected, which is interesting, but that's what the mounting instructions say. So, who is the data sheet to lie? gonna find my K 
kit with a bunch of screw terminals. I don't know. I think I really want to do a double screw terminal here. But I'm not sure what the other options are. Almost identical. Got some spades. Let's see if maybe these will fit into one of the shrouded ones. I don't really want to use the wrong connector, but no, nope, no good. Okay, so in that case, probably just going to attach a couple of these onto wires, do that, and then make sure these don't come in contact with each other. And that'll make it actually really easy to swap this out or add anything on later. So I like that plan for the most part. Um, see if I have the right sizes in here to color code them. Not all of these are available in exactly the same size. Just need to find a matching pair. Seems pretty good. Okay, so you use those, clamp those down, and some solid core wire. Probably just get this out of the way for now. It's negative is the negative, and one is the positive. As soon as I turn on this fan, the audio is just going to be gone. So I'm going to mute before that happens. Come back afterwards. Don't need too much wire on this. I like them to be relatively matched, though. And this thing's only doing 40 volts. It is a pretty significant current, but these old wires... I'll look it up later. For the moment, this is what I have, and I can always swap it out on the capacitor. Won't be too bad. Let's drop that down. Hoping OBS does not make a mess of this. It's the first thing I tried using to record. Just would not record audio, no matter which source I tried or how I went about it. I would absolutely refuse, and eventually I give up on that. So, lost or have muted the first part of the footage, um, taking it apart. Unfortunately, I was also explaining how that worked, so I had to go back over some of that. But I have no idea what I'm doing here, so just going to start sticking things together. That is stinking, so I need to get the fan on.
I don't know if you've ever seen someone wrestle a capacitor, but that's what I just did. Try to do the Clive style, hold everything while you go soldering, but I don't always have enough fingers for that. I'm not an expert like he is, so doesn't always work. I'm going to grab some heat shrink and snip a little bit off for this. Bending these leads gave me just enough leverage to solder them. Bend that over, lock those in place, and then I actually want two pieces. No, these are shrouded. Don't need. Yeah, they've got their own. Okay, so now we're just going to pop these on. We probably should tin this first, huh? Well, too late now. Well, I didn't do a thing. Really clamp that down. That's better than I think. Okay, let's try some solder. That is not going to stay otherwise. Doesn't look awful. I mean, it looks awful, but it looks like it'll stay. That's what matters. I think I stripped these back like way too far. Um, they don't really need to be exactly the same length, so let's fix that. Loosen this side. It's too late for the other one. Let that peek out just a little bit. It's a little bit more solder on there. But I'm going to need to turn that fan on for that. Smoky. Alright, kill the fan. Can't possibly be good for headphones. Alright, those look pretty good. I don't think those are going to come off anytime soon. Yeah, plenty for what I'm doing. This is going to be tacked down eventually, but I don't have any kind of sticky pads right now. And I probably want to put some Velcro or something on there. We'll see if to have to see how hot it gets. Um, but for now, I'll just go with this and do this, this heat shrink. And then put a bleeder resistor over this. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to do that. I want to heat shrink these down, so I don't think it's going to be at the bottom there. Um, I might just put that in through the screw terminals and then this thing doesn't have any kind of safety capacitors, so just in case, I also grabbed a bit of mounting board, mounting strip, whatever this weird old mounting stuff is. I just 
forget you have to lift this up before it'll start. This thing is not nearly as loud as my soldering fan. I used to have a much, much quieter soldering fan. It's a pair of PC fans. But I don't do quite as good of a job. It's almost like fans get louder as they move more air. In this case, less air and more rosin fumes. All sorts of fun things. Definitely tell when you've gotten a good lung full of flux. This shrink? I don't think it's supposed to, but... Oh no, it totally does. Will it shrink all the way? That's the real question here. It's still pretty good. All right, it's good enough for today. We got one fancy fight capacitor there. Some bunny ears on that. And this whole thing ends up being about the same size as the original. So that'll actually fit great, except for the radius. It's just a little bit different. Probably going to need these are X1. I believe they're also Y rated. Got their little certification stickers. And uh, Y2, X1. So yeah, these should be good. I'll just pull out three of these. I don't actually know like, how much capacitance this thing should have, but I don't need three. I'm just going to do two. Just cross the line and then. Neutral side to ground. I don't think there'll be any benefit to doing a third one. Not for something that is going to be generating more noise than it sees. And then for the safety sake, and this thing's already used and it has a three pin polarized line cord. So I'm not worried about that. But I do want to pop a bleeder resistor across that because when you charge this thing up, at least the old one, it would make a nice shock. Got some rubber grommets here. I don't know if I'll need those. All right, so we got two safety capacitors, a toothbrush, tuning screwdriver, bleeder, and a random PCC that was just laying around. Get this chunky boy back up here. It's going to go in like so. I'm going to screw this down, screw this down, and then I'll just give them a quick wrap of Captain tape. Maybe Captain and vinyl. I like the Captain because it has super high dielectric, but it doesn't stick quite as well. I could probably flag it around these, but if they have a bolt through them, it's not going to work quite as well either, and then we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, if I can find some, I'll get clever and use some nylon screws. I have some standoffs that could potentially work. Otherwise, you can take and either screw it or somehow tack it all down to here. I don't know. Just for the moment, I need to find... I put that old line card. Oh, it's in the case back here. I have a terrible habit of forgetting the cases and soldering these things together without the case on. And then I have to take off the cord and I have to do it all over again.
don't know what size this is. Just guessing. And then I don't know yet the best place to chassis ground this because it mentioned, and this may have been the lost part, these are all hard rubber grommets. You can hear that. But there's no rubber there. So, not hard rubber, they're hard plastic. So they're not rubber. So I don't need to replace them. Like they're not gonna crack or anything. They seem to be good isolation. But I still need to find a place for the ground. And based on the length of this, if this is coming about here, run this around, I'm thinking the capacitor loop is actually gonna be perfect because I can just even put another nut on there or something, maybe solder it in, or even pull it over and stick it in the middle of the clamp here and really get it. So I think that is going to be the best way, and then that is well screwed down to the front. And beep all that out and make sure. Okay, so if we're on this, that's not doing anything. So it's good through there, but that's all painted up. Interesting. The paint's not that good. Okay, I think that will serve as a pretty solid ground. These are perfectly well isolated still. Isolated, nothing fun there. But the meters, like all of this, meter terminals, still isolated. So this will be good. Everything up here is no connections. But then if I get down in here, the heat sink bolts, and then the capacitor clip, and all of the meters. The painted parts aren't, but so you won't get it there. But if you get in the screw holes, all of those peep it up. So that should be nice and safe. I have to get that run through the case. And this case needs cleaned out. So I might have to do that first. Probably turn off the iron here. So this is the re-recording of the audio. When I came back from washing off the chassis, I hit record in OBS again, and my computer crashed. When it came back, the audio wasn't there, and it was still monitoring through my headset, so I kept recording and didn't notice. So I'm going to try and narrate over it and hopefully get something halfway decent. I was looking for a different color screw terminal for the ground lead. But I wasn't able to find anything. So ended up having to use yellow. It's third color in this kit and really would rather keep them separate colors instead of necessarily color matching them correctly. So red to red, blue to black, and yellow to green. The closest I could get. need to learn to keep these on camera when I'm crimping. This one doesn't reach all the way down to the chassis and I don't want to solder it onto the back plate. So we just sort of have to hold it up in the air. Try and do something. wire gets pretty warm, those screw terminals are not small. They can take quite a bit of heat and the wire really starts to heat up. So This whole time I was turning off the microphone when the fan was on, but with sound cancelling or noise cancelling on the microphone, you really can't hear any of the fans that I have going. So next time, if I get audio, when I get audio, I will just keep that on 
and definitely keep talking. It seems like as long as the source of the noise is further away from the mic than my voice, it works out more or less, so really can't hear the solder fan. So I want to put the ground lead on one of these vertical, I guess if you, once you put the faceplate back in, horizontal studs, but I don't have the right size nut for those. They are not a metric size, which is not super surprising given the era and probably location where this was built. I have no reason to believe this was imported from Europe at any point, and in the 60s it's pretty unlikely that they would have been using metric to my knowledge. But I'm not a bolt scientist, so I just have to guess at that. I'm not exactly sure if these screw terminals are heat shrink or not, or if the first two just shrunk of their own volition. This one did not shrink very well. I kept the hot air gun on there for a minute, but nothing really happened. So eventually just gave up and screwed it down. The plastic did soften, but it didn't really shrink any, so I'm not sure what was up with that. Um, after looking at this a little bit, the easiest place to get that in, and with these capacitor leads, as long as they are, you can almost connect the capacitor directly to the filtered output terminals, which would be interesting because then those terminals would effectively be filtered. But it's going to be better or easier just to keep the existing screw terminals. And I got out some M3 hardware to try and do this with. But these screw terminals are quite a bit larger. M5, more likely. So even with the washers that I have, uh, the lock nuts that I got just don't fit at all. Nothing happening there. So they completely fit through the middle of the larger, the, the existing screw terminals that were on there. And those are the ones that I was trying to avoid removing. So just have to find some M4 nuts to make that work. In the meantime, twist these leads up and I think at this point I had already tinned the ends. So I could ground it to the back. Um, the whole panel is grounded, but I'd rather keep the wires all connected to the front panel and the way it was originally set up the white wire, the live, goes into the switch the neutral black wire goes into the fuse and then from there on to uh, the neon and, and the transformer so the switch also goes into the neon and the transformer the primary winding and then those all get gathered up and end up together again um, and that's just the, the primary side is very simple, it's just a loop there. I'm going to tack this down to the switch, and that. So we got the white wire connected up and just good clearance there. Get the neutral side hooked up to the fuse. And the way they have this set up, the neutral goes to the top of the fuse and then it comes out the side. 
the live goes into the bottom of the switch and comes out the top. The fuse holder actually can take quite a bit of heat. I probably should have taken the fuse out before doing this, come to think of it, but did not. It definitely survived, so no harm done. Not too much. Make sure these are secure. There's enough clearance in the middle of the switch there. Um, it's just completely loose, so there's not really anything to prevent that from arcing other than the air gap. The toothbrush does not fit between the contacts, but an M3 bolt does, so I'd be very surprised if the voltages it, that are present here can arc across that much. It's a couple millimeters of air. Now this back panel is all bent up. One of the screws on top was loose. I'm not sure how that came to be, if that was, happened while it was being built or while it was being removed. I don't remember it catching when I first removed it, besides on the cord. So I don't think it was when I was taking it apart. I think it was dropped at some point. Still a tremendous amount of dust in here. So, I'm going to get out the party liquor, wipe it down real quick with a shop towel, see if I can get some of that out, just clean it up a little bit. Some nice 60 year old gunk in there. use the toothbrush to loosen it up a little bit before I wipe it out. And the alcohol gets most of it, but I don't want to spend too much time scrubbing at it because there's, it's a really nice paint job on the front panel here, and it's still mostly intact, so I want to leave it intact as much as possible. Um, on these older paints, if you let the alcohol sit for more than 30 seconds or so, it'll really start to melt. So. The meters in the front are disgusting as well. Mostly on the top, it was definitely stored in the most dusty place in the world. Not quite as bad as the sandstorm signal generator, which I will show everyone soon, but yeah, this thing was definitely pretty dusty all over. The transformer, the meters, both front and back. Like the dust got everywhere. It was it was inside, it was outside, it was all over. And this tape that they used, or what used to be tape, is now becoming some sort of straw. Can't tell if it was paper or wood. It, it seems more fibrous, like it was some sort of plant material to begin with, but it's definitely some kind of weavable reed. You can make a basket out of it now. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not in great shape. I don't really want to mess with the windings or cause any kind of shorts, so I'm going to leave that in place. And some of this wiring, I don't want to go through and completely rewire this whole thing today. Um, so just going to wipe down some of the worst of the wires. They are the nice braided cover, and the covers are in pretty good shape. Some more scribbling on the back here. Looks more like a signature than a date code. Just going to get in the middle here because this wire is pretty nasty as well. Hard to get down in the front of the windings at all, but got most of it. 
hands are absolutely covered in just the most disgusting dust. There's so many things in that dust that have just accumulated over the years. It becomes sticky. It's just a whole layer unto itself. Misplaced all of my new components. Uh, I ended up under the faceplate here. So I need to pull those out and start adding some of the other stuff. Uh, the new capacitor is wired up in and of itself. So that's ready to go in place. And then I want to get this bleeder resistor across because the old one, when I first cracked this thing open, um, a good, I don't even know, a, a few hours after it had last been run, it immediately, uh, I went to check that capacitors, figured I should short it out, and it's a big old spark. So my screwdriver can handle that, but I don't want to accidentally catch that. Um, the connectors on the front, they're pretty beefy, which is good for the amperage that they're going to take, and they have shrouds. They're, they're very well shrouded. So you're not really getting into those by accident. But this is only an issue if you're going to be poking your fingers in here. I'm trying to solder this on with a cold iron doesn't work so well. Definitely recommend turning on your soldering iron before trying to use it. It doesn't have quite the same kick if you don't. And you can see this Heiko's. It counts up nice and quick. Uh, and according to my soldering iron thermometer, it's pretty accurate. I've heard that there are better options, but for what I do, this is plenty. Especially, this is about the, the largest stuff that I work on. These old radios and older power supplies tend to have the beefiest components. Everything else is PCB, surface mount, signal level stuff, so... This fan can really suck. It's nice because the whole my whole lab setup, my office is in the basement, so I don't have a lot of ventilation besides fans coming in and out, and a vent in the ceiling, the window under here is not one for ventilation or anything. The screw terminal started to twist around uh, when I was soldering the resistor on. There wasn't anything to hold it in place and it just started to twist around the end of the wire. So I'm going to get the other end of this hooked up to the positive leads. To that tacked down, but I think the best way to do that is just going to be to wrap the other lead around itself and then screw that through. This isn't going to be under, oh, excuse me, this isn't going to be under any stress once the case is closed and the capacitor is attached. So I'm going to stick the capacitor in place or clamp it down. So it's not going to be moving around. Um, this lead is not going to be wobbling around in the breeze at all. So it shouldn't be too bad if it is looped around and sort of becomes part of the whole screw assembly. But if this wasn't just bridging two contacts that are otherwise fixed in place. I wouldn't leave it flapping around in the breeze like that. Just loop that, gave it a couple twists, and attack. It's a good strong loop there. So I'm going to pull this down. 
and start stacking everything up to make sure the fit is good. But yeah, the resistor fits across the terminals now, so that should keep the voltage down on that. Because that capacitor it has a really bad habit of recharging the dielectric, uh, whatever it is, the, the dielectric wander inside is pretty strong. So there's some electrons in the middle that will work their way back out after you discharge it the first time. And I forget what it gets back up to, but if you watch it for long enough, it will get back up to 2 volts, 2.5 two volts. Uh, it's enough to light an LED. So you want to leave it discharging. Um, and I assume you know, that all went for the original one. I, I assume it goes for the same this replacement one as well because they're the same capacity. So this one is a little bit smaller in actual volume, and I imagine it will discharge more quickly, but I don't want to take chances with that. At the end of the video, I will charge up and then use my screwdriver to discharge the original capacitor. Makes a nice spark. For the moment, I'm going to find some M4 bolts, and fiberglass washers. Still probably not the right size, but it will definitely work. The M4 washers will not slip through. So, Unfortunately, I don't have any extra nuts of whatever size this uses. I need to figure that out and then try and get some. Um, seems to be one of the, the SAE sizes. But for the moment, I'm just going to take the ground and can't get this nut off, have to put it through the actual middle of the clamp, the part where the screw goes through, because that will definitely hold it. And this one, I don't know what they did. I was really cranked down on there. Even using the Nipex, I couldn't get it off. So, Rather than fight that too much, figure maybe take the screw out from the front, but I'm gonna see if this one fits. And it's a loose fit, just the wrong kind of loose fit where it wants to stay in place now and doesn't want to thread itself back off. That's not great. I have to wedge the tweezers under here and then start to undo it with sort of that slope under it to push it up. That's out. And that washer is not going to be any better, so I'm not going to use those. For the moment, it's just going to have to be the screw in the metal. There isn't really another way, uh, a good way to ground it other than this capacitor ring. And there are a few other places just sort of on the board that are attached, but I could potentially go to one of the heat sink bolts, I guess. Um, but none of them are in range. Maybe the heat sink bolts would be. But this has the benefit of also being on the same side as everything else, so it's pretty clear where everything comes in and goes to. No one's going to be looking for the ground, unable to find it, and shock themselves. I'm not sure how that would happen, but I'm the only one likely to be sticking my fingers in here. Unless it survives longer than I do. I don't know why they put this ring facing this direction. It would have been significantly better if they had put it the other direction so that the um, that nut was on the outside. Because I can't even get my screwdriver in between the fan and the ring to even start to screw it in. So in the, the 
tiny tuning screwdriver and the tweezers, nothing was doing. So I actually had to just stick my finger in there and hold the nut down and screw it in by hand. That was good enough. I was able to start getting it screwed down. And once you get it screwed down a little ways, you know, it'll hold itself in place. So I'm able to tip the thing up, move it around a little bit more, and use my actual screwdriver after that. But what a nuisance. And they could have just fixed that by putting it on the other side. I really don't think that it's super necessary to have it that way. But I'm not going to go poking holes in the chassis if I can help it, and especially not the faceplate. So that is what it is for now. Just going to have to leave it. Really tighten this down. I was cranked on there pretty well before, and it has a lock washer, so I want to make sure that bites well. Make sure there's good contact with the ground. Um, the plastic piece is clear of the clamp, so that works perfectly. And then I got it at an angle. It's pretty tight, so it's not going to move now, but. It's actually not a problem for the capacitor because it's so much shorter than the original. I can probably just leave the capacitor sitting on the bottom. I wouldn't really need to attach it in the, the exact same spot. But I'm going to take the line cord and test beep this out. Considering this is a re-recording, you won't be able to hear the beeping, but the meters, the meter clamps, um, the whole front chassis plate, like all of that, beeps out to ground well. The magnetic coil and the screws, I think, are also grounded. I left a little bit of a mark there, but it was already beeping to ground, so I wasn't actually insulating or isolating it at all, the paint on there. Um, so yeah, the whole front panel, and then once I screw it in, the back panel will be all grounded out but both of the meters, the bridge coming in, all of that is still isolated and either attached to the transformer, uh, I guess attached to the transformer one way or another, mostly on the secondary side. So the whole, whole secondary side of the transformer is floating, and I think if you were to do it right, you could even reference this to something above Earth ground, because if you were to float the second side, you'd be good. Um, to get the safety capacitors in here, I'm going to have to attach them, one across the line and one from line to ground. So I don't know where the best ground point is. The best live point is going to be the switch. The one contact of the switch. And I think in this case, I put it on the bottom contact of the switch, which actually leaves the capacitor connected, uh, even when the switch is off, which is not right. I'm sort of glad I went back through and had to re-record this because I noticed that that should be con connected to the middle contact of the switch or the top contact. This is um, single pole, single pole, single throw. So it's really just the two contacts, and it should go from the fuse. So on the fuse side, I did do it correctly, and I, I put it after the fuse, so the fuse is still protecting the capacitors. Um, so it's not the worst thing in the world if the capacitor does happen to fill short, then live will dump through the capacitor into the fuse. Getting to the ground is going to be more interesting. That's much further away, and I don't have any nuts to attach to these closer posts. You get two of these in there, and I'm going to do a quick twist on the shared leg so that they can both hook up to the fuse, and then get some heat shrink on all of the legs, you know, the shared one 
and the others. I want to color code that. And I have red and black here, but I need to grab some white and green from the closet. Twist these together real quick and then solder the ends. So still I need to remember to do this on camera. Um, you can tell I know what I'm doing because I'm using my fingers as heat sinks and that's definitely one of the best ways to go. Your fingers can absorb a lot of heat before you have to run out of the room screaming. around in the closet here, find some heat shrink, and only got a couple pieces. I think those are too big, so leave that assembly on the table here. Go find some more. I'm going to take this other heat shrink and off camera, cut it to length, just nip a little bit off the green, got red and green, because this is on the AC side, red is sort of debatable. Shrink these down and tell right away that I'm using the wrong size because it starts falling off even before I've had a chance to even do anything. This one on the common negative sort of stays on for a second, because that is two wires together, and they were enough to hold that size in place, but it's not secure. A piece of red heat shrink went flying. Let's get that put back on. But with the black not shrinking down all the way, I want to try and find some single wire shrink in white and green. Although I grabbed red again before realizing that we were working on the AC side, so if you want to be conventional about it, this one's going to be right. And that was a completely wasted piece of heat shrink, because so I put it on, shrunk it down, and then it just slipped right off, and you ended up needing a different color anyways, so. Oh well, I have I think, two or three drawers of the stuff in the closet. Shrink this down a little bit. I 
Okay, so we've got the two safety capacitors soldered together in the common leg. I'm gonna get that attached to the fuse. Realize that it needs to go on the side of the fuse because I want these to be protected by the fuse as well. I don't want these capacitors to be protecting the fuse. I want if the fuse blows, the capacitor should be cut off. So in this case, if the um, if the fuse is between the capacitors and the neutral, even if the capacitor does fail short and shorts the live into the fuse, um, you're just going to have the full current going through the fuse and it's going to blow right away. So it shouldn't present much of a shock hazard. And then once the fuse is gone with the with the safety capacitor hooked up to the switched side of the live, you know, then the, the safety capacitors are responsible for shunting anything there down to the ground. Adding a, just a little bit of solder to these old joints. I don't know if it helps remove the oxidation or what the deal is, but really helps attach things to them. They solder a lot faster. There's a, an outer surface that tries to resist the heat. Give that in place and then make sure that's on there pretty well. I don't want to put too much stress on these leads, but I do want to make sure that, you know, it's not a cold joint, it's a strong joint. Realizing that I put all of this on backwards because I need the live, the what is currently red, to be pointing upwards, um, which basically just means rotating it around the neutral and ground axis. If you were to draw a line through that one capacitor, then the other one is just going to be sticking up north of that line. Got that flipped around, but getting the positive, like it's, it's just not long enough, and this heat shrink's already starting to come off. Just gonna take that out of the way for now. Well, originally, sort of looking at the negative post here and thinking that's where I'm gonna put the ground, but with the Neutral the ground capacitor. But that's not an option because that is floating. That's isolated from the chassis ground. So I actually want to run that that uh, capacitor. It's coming down from the neutral line to the chassis ground. That needs to be chassis grounded. It can't be floating on the negative output. Strip down a couple of pieces of wire here. This is the halfway decent solid core stuff. It still came in a, one of those sampler boxes, but it's pretty good. Bent it around some and can definitely hold up to a couple hundred volts. And this isn't going to be dealing with anything like that. Cutting this one for completely the wrong side. Um, that is the, this terminal is negative, it's not even ground, but it, it's actually a negative terminal, but the live is supposed to be going up north, so let me go over here and get some other wire, some white wire to match, I'm going to run that into the switch. If I haven't mentioned this already, I did run it into the always-on pole post of the switch, the 
contact that the live is directly connected to. And that is not what you want. You definitely want to attach that capacitor, any capacitor, to the switch side so that the capacitor is not taking surges once you hit the switch. Once the device is switched off, you know, you know you want that to cut off the capacitor as well. So this is the ground, you can't use that. These are both stood off from the chassis itself. Going to need to find a better place to link these in. And there are a few options here. The ring that was around the original capacitor is grounded to the front panel, connected through. So that one has some potential. Um, going across the mains also could work but that's going to be a little bit more complicated tin this piece of wire and then this is going to connect to one of the capacitors. Let me get that in the top. Up into the switch. Mount that all the way through and then that piece of wire will actually go into the switch like the other one. Um, it's starting to get real hot so let me use the tweezers and fix that. Just going to melt this and pull it out a little bit so that they don't get caught on each other. And then take the second one, line it up, and sort of free flow them together. There's plenty of room in the mounting point, so. Make sure there's enough of a, a gap there. Tweezers fit in there, that should be good. That is one of the capacitors covered up. So now the other one, and this is a little bit trickier. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to run that. I may leave that flying for today. I'm just going to take this one that I have ready to go and reflow that together with this piece of wire. piece of heat shrink over there. It doesn't work nearly as well if you add the heat shrink after you've soldered everything. Uh, it's a lot more difficult that way. I would definitely recommend doing heat shrink before the soldering. Just gonna get that lined up. These are really not super prone to moving. The solid core wire, if you bump it or you press it really hard, it will get out of the way. But for something like this, where I just want to give it the slightest bit of heat, I just hold the iron under them and hold the use the solder to push them down. It reflows a perfect joint. Just make sure that that is nice and secure. And now that everything is connected through it. It is. Get the heat shrink over that. And then 
the next question is where the ground goes because I mean it could go to any of the screw holes on the front panel really like it doesn't matter they are all connected together at the end of the day but I want to get it you know, the only place it can't go are these standoffs because those are actually the power supply so I really want to take it through the capacitor ring um, just based on the fact that the other ground is already there that means that it's pretty likely should something go horribly wrong that ring is where any stray current goes and it just goes back out through the, the line cord so in my case that's going to set off a GFCI but I don't have any extra nuts for these and I don't really want to take the ground uh, to put a screw terminal on the ground because I don't think I'm going to be able to fit another screw terminal in that clamp well so until I can find another nut that will fit on these, I may have to leave the ground not connected. Although, this is no longer the line cord and chassis ground. Those are connected. This will just be the safety capacitor um, and one of them. So there'll be some noise filtering across the line, but there won't be a ton of noise filtering from the, the line to the chassis should any kind of noise come in. I mean, when it comes to noise filtering, honestly, this thing relies almost entirely on the choke followed by the capacitor. And as a massive capacitor, it takes a second to charge up. You can watch it happen if you plug this in and hook it up to the voltmeter right away. So you can see the, the capacitor rising until it hits steady. And then if you put a sudden load on it, it will discharge quite a bit and takes a second to charge back up. So it's a very simple power supply, very heavy. It's good for quite a few amps. And that's what I what I want from it. So this one I think I could potentially solder to the inside of the ring. And I really want the current to follow the path up to the existing ground, the line cord. So just strip a piece of wire back and then try and do that. After a little bit of work trying to solder this on, it, it turns out that this ring is coated in something. I don't know if it was stainless or if it's real dirty or if it had a zinc coating. It could have even been magnesium that they used. Um, but it's definitely took solder and did not take wire. Solder would stick to one or the other. And it was you know, starting to warm up. I, I was able to, around this point, put the iron on one side and started adding solder. Um, and you could sort of write on the surface. The solder would beat up on the surface and then it would take a second and it would flow. But I don't know, I guess it never got warm enough to actually reflow that wire into the middle. I ended up with a, a good glob of solder on the inside, but it didn't really do anything for me. So This will all be very easily solved when I can find another nut, and I mean, maybe I will just put a screw terminal onto the end of the safety capacitor, although that seems a little silly. Um, but I'll just screw that down one way or another. I'm going to try and solder this wire down and when the solder melts the wire gets hot it really started to heat up but it doesn't do much else like the the wire sleeving melted started to peel back um, and then I let everything cool down you could see it flash over once it tested again and the wire just pops off so I don't really think there's anything I can do to solder down onto that it's just not going to happen, at least not today. 
depending on what I end up doing, worst case, I can poke a hole in it and attach something either through the hole and then try and solder it again, or through the hole and or put a bolt through the hole and then attach anything else onto that. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to end up doing. It's also possible to cut the line cord or the, the ground. You can see that it goes right past the pair of safety capacitors. So if I were to cut the ground there, I could put a three-way joint on that and have it go, come in from the line cord, go to the safety capacitor, and then go to the, capa the old capacitor ring. And that will ground off the chassis. So I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to go about that. Um, I tried both the M3 and the M4. Neither of them fit, which makes sense. There's no reason for this to be metric, like I think I said before. But I don't have whatever size this actually is looking for handy. I don't have a kit of those. Tons and tons of M3, like literally hundreds of M3 nuts, but I don't have a kit of the uh, SAE sizes. I don't think anything useful is going to happen trying to put solder onto this nut. It looks like stainless and I think it's just going to shed the solder right away, which it does. So, no luck there. Don't want to leave just a, sort of a single lead stubbing out there into the into space. Um, it's not the best place for it to be. There's quite a few things that it could come in contact with, and the most likely one for it to contact is the front plate, which is probably the best because you know, that's sort of where I want it to end up anyways. I do want it to be grounded, but I would rather not have those flapping around, so I do want to attach that down somewhere. fuse here is the first mounting point and then I could put it up to the back and this whole thing gets connected to the chassis. This panel has a screw that goes into it but I don't know if that is reliable and I don't know what the distance is on that. I could measure out the impedance but I'd rather keep them connected as close as possible considering that all of the other sort of AC input stuff is already clustered on that side. There's some AC on the left before it hits the bridge, but that is going to be much more limited in voltage. Um, and having gone through a transformer, you're also, I guess, technically isolated to some extent. So this one, if I can get a nut on there or loosen up this one at some point and maybe screw it under. Pretty easy to hook up to the bottom of the capacitor ring there. You can potentially even loosen that screw if the, the nut and the screw are stuck together. If I can loosen the screw a little bit from the front and push the nut and the capacitor ring backwards then I can slip the wire underneath, clamp it down, and it should make contact should make contact, it never does make contact, so when in doubt, ohm it out.
in the lead of this neutral to ground capacitor and get rid of any little spikies there. Um, this one, for the moment at least, I'm just going to flag off. I, you know, I guess that's a little bit better than how things were before I got here. It's not as good as I would like them to be in the end. I'm going to make sure that all of the screw terminals, all of the safety capacitors are connected, heat shrunk, isolated, whatever they need to be. But it's got a ground. Uh, it just doesn't have filtering to the ground. So shrink that down real quick to make sure that no one can stick their fingers in it. not really much to say here. It's just going to get the leads attached and then flag it off with a piece of vinyl electrical tape because I don't want to let that wander around more than necessary. Um, the only thing it can come in contact with really is the thing it should come in contact with or the negative post of this power supply. And the negative post of this power supply is not otherwise connected uh, to the the low side of anything really so that might not actually be the zero that ground wants it to be of course I am not a safety expert so don't disconnect your ground capacitors or cables or cords or anything and leave all of the safety measures in place ask someone professional certification and don't listen to people on YouTube even though that's what I do so with this hardware I got some fiberglass washers, but they are not large enough for the bolts. I didn't get enough washers, uh, metal washers, because I was hoping the fiberglass ones would work. And I don't really have any lock washers for the M4 size. All of my lock washers, I actually have a couple different kinds in M3, but I don't have any M4 lock washers. So, I'm just going to have to stack everything up here and try and get it connected. Um, like I said, pins 2 and 3 on the capacitor can be not connected or tied to ground. It doesn't say under what circumstances you should do which one. So I'm just going to leave them not connected for now and cover them up later if need be. The loop on this bleeder resistor is super tight. Barely fits around the screw. It doesn't fit around the threads. It actually has to be screwed on there. So getting that attached is a little bit of a nuisance. Even using the tweezers to open it up sort of made it a little bit looser, but So now, getting this whole stack put together and tightened down is one of the last steps. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how to keep these isolated from one another and from sort of the rest of the chassis. This is the 
secondary side of the winding, the capacitor and choke and the output. Um, so I don't want them connecting to the chassis ground, that would just take all of the power and, and dump it back through. Probably set off my GFCI if all goes well. Um, I guess I'm not sure if the DC output from this would set off the GFCI. I haven't really looked into that. I always I know the, the AC well if current leaks through, but I don't know about the DC. Anyways, screwing this in is interesting. The screw is at a pretty unpleasant angle. And then the nut and washer, as soon as I start screwing it in, the nut and washer get bound up against the dropper resistor because that loop is actually so tight that it's acting as a, a binding nut. And they're just backing up against each other and tightening it down. Which if you wanted to hold it in place would be great, but I don't. I want to just compress the whole thing and, and make as much of a sandwich as possible. So backing off the outer nut, the black one, slightly put enough space between them, I mean, they're rotating at the same rate because I'm holding the resistor and the nut in place, but put enough space between them to get the screw tightened down, and then at the end, you can always go and tighten down the second nut as well. finally got a sort of acceptable line on that screw. Um, it'll be easier once I stand the whole thing up. But I only grabbed two of the metal washers, hoping that these fiberglass ones would do the trick. I don't really feel like drilling out the middle of the fiberglass ones, so I need a pair of other metal washers. Put that over the bolt, and then this one only has two contacts. That all tightened down. Um, I probably should have soldered the resistor up onto the clip for the other one, but I mean, this does hold well. It has a good connection. Uh, it's just maybe not the recommended application of these components. This is the last section here. Still doesn't have any audio, so I'm re-recording that. Everything's ready. Brushed off the transformer here, and it's an interesting setup. Um, there's a tap in the front, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But the tape is definitely coming apart. I don't want to replace that, and I don't want to mess with the tar too much, so I'm going to leave that as, as it is. The capacitor is just sort of set in place for the moment. But uh, all of that wire is nice and stiff, so it's not going anywhere. In order to get this tested, you need to get it hooked up on the dim bulb, and that means getting the line cord plugged in. Uh, it means putting the dim bulb on the bench, and I need to get a few things moved out of the way first. Solder tower just takes up an inordinate amount of space. I think I like it, but I might have to switch back to the roll. It's just so unwieldy to use. Maybe take the roll off before you use the tower. I don't know. Some of these odds and ends out of the way, some of the old components that have come out, or well, I guess every all of the new components are in, so it's just old components and miscellaneous at this point. And then hopefully that will be enough room to get the chassis through which the line cord is trapped, because you know, that's how these things are set up. And then I need to get the dim bulb tester out here as well. 
And that, if you're not familiar with a dim bulb tester, it's just a pair of, in my case, a pair of lamp lights, incandescent bulbs, and incandescent bulbs are positive temperature coefficient resistors. Uh, so as the temperature increases, so does the resistance. And that means that the more current coming through them, the more temperature, the more resistance, and they sort of self-regulate and makes them sort of a, a reusable, resettable fuse, um, even better than a fuse. They don't blow out in the first place and hopefully prevent other components from going as well. When you have something like this plugged in and if you see the bulbs light up bright, flip the switch, turn the tester off and see which capacitor you put in backwards because something's messed up. The idea is that any current that goes through the device under test here also has to go through the bulbs, so any heat gets dissipated in both places. Hopefully the bulb takes enough that you can get it turned off before whatever failing component or incorrectly installed component explodes. Keep all the schmoo contained. And this tester is a GFCI and an outlet. Um, the power supply here has its own fuse. It's actually pretty well set up. It had a fuse from the very beginning. It didn't have a ground, but it had a fuse. Um, and this is a 250 volt, it looks like 3 amp fuse. It says bus. so. It's a bus AGC3. I'm guessing that's a busman. 3 amp fuse. Considering the math on this, uh, if you think about sort of it's supposed to put out 16 volts at 10 amps, it's about 160 watts. And coming in on the other side, probably want at least 1 amp. I'm guessing they did something a little bit higher to hand because if it's one amp for the 10 sorry one amp on the input side for 10 amps on the output side but the output peak is 20 amps it's 10 amps continuous 20 amps peak so you need at least a, a two amp fuse on the incoming side if my math is right and with a little bit of margin um, if you're counting like rms versus peak voltage you're going to want three amps there I think Little Fuse recommends you always rate it for 125% of the sort of the constant current draw of just keeping the thing on. So, yeah, those numbers sort of work out. 3 amp fuse should be plenty. The bulbs that I have in the bulb tester right now, uh, 60 watts a piece, and I have a, two of them in parallel. So when they're fully lit up. There's a potential for 120 watts, and there's quite a significant voltage drop to the device under test at that point because um, the bulbs will potentially be consuming up to 120 watts on their own. If the device under test is also trying to do that, you know, you're pulling 240, about 2 amps off the wall. I forget what fuse I put in the dim bulb tester. I think it's a, a 1 amp at the moment, so... That should blow before the device under test can equal the bulbs. I guess the, the device under test will always equal the bulbs, but it will blow before the bulbs can max out. Get this plugged in. At one point where I'm very glad that my camera is mounted to the shelves instead of to the cart. Um, because it used to just r rock around whenever I did something on the cart. So that's fixed now. I'm going to move, remove one of the bulbs, put in the, the one on this side, and take out the other side. So you can actually see what's going on here. So 
So I've got a GFCI on here, and you can see that's active now. So when I flip that on, if I have things done correctly, then I'll actually start getting some voltage on the device here. And I've got the ground set up. Um, and this ground is not clipped, so that's now grounded through to the actual ground. I don't want to connect the live and, and the ground. That will send some current. It's not, I guess, fully isolated once you have the this device grounded as well. Uh, just finishing up the test procedure here. These are the fun gloves. You can do all sorts of things, but today I'm just trying to prevent electrocution. And make sure the 60 watt bulb is nice and secure. Go to flip this on, but uh, it definitely works better if you plug in the device under test before you try and test it. They tend not to do much if you haven't plugged them in. Give the screws all of the various mounting points one last quick check. Make sure everything's in order there. And then gonna get this thing fired up. There's my meter here. It's in volts mode. Turn it on. The meter's already on. Turn on the power supply. Actually, turn it properly on here. We're getting some output. Um, no smoke and no immediate fire, so that's good. You can see that big tank capacitor charging up. The thing definitely takes a little while to reach sort of steady state voltage, especially considering that I have the Variac on here. Um, I have, I think I have it set to about 65 volts right now, so getting 6.5 on the output is, is not bad, especially on the zero to eight range. Like I said, it runs hot, it runs up to closer to 12. So. It seems to be slowly charging, holding pretty steady at about a 6.5, 6.6. So I'm going to flip that up to the high range and see what that does. And that climbs pretty well also. Coming up on 13 volts here. Just considering I still have the Variac set way low. That's pretty good. So, reach over here and stick my head in the shot, crank the Variac, you can see the, the lamp light up there, so I might have to keep the suction, um, and that goes up to 25 volts pretty quickly, lamp's on, actually getting some real output now. And this, it's still a little bit low on the voltage, um, because, like I said, it, it will go up to about, it's marked at 29, it'll go up to 30 or 32 if you let it. But that shouldn't be a problem now. The bulb is glowing brightly because the capacitor is definitely pulling some current trying to charge. You can see it sort of struggling to charge. I really turned it all the way up right away, and competing with that bulb for current for power I'm not sure what the input voltage is at this point my dim bulb tester doesn't have a voltmeter of its own um, it's actually something I left out and would be really useful to have to see the output voltage of the dim bulb tester after the bulb after the current has sort of passed through the incandescent but Here's the sticker for that, and it says originally getting 29 on the top, and, and mine are, my outlets are 125, so I'd expect that to be closer to 30, 31, 32. The lower range, he was getting 19. I think I've seen that go as high as 20 or 21. Flipping it down um, with that bleeder resistor on there it drains pretty well. 
it drains nice and quick down to, I guess, what the, the steady state will end up being. Um, oh, I still have that at the max. So I turn this down, and it says it goes down to zero. It does not go all the way down to zero in my experience. I think, based on looking at the, the design here, I'm just going to try and tip this forwards. There's a tap, and the, the way the white wire that's moving is connected to a variable tap on the transformer. And that's the main power transformer. Um, and the way that's set up is it's just narrowing where the bridge is tapped across the two halves of that transformer, the, the two coils there. I guess the two halves of the coil. Um, so that may be off. It has stops on both ends, so I'm not exactly sure how that would happen, but it definitely seems as though it just got rotated a few degrees, like the knob or the relative to the, the knob or relative to the stops, and that's allowing it to go up because it's not exactly twice what it should be. I know the sort of planned input was probably 117, and I'm giving it at most 125, but it's not coming up with exactly half the value. So I'm thinking that maybe that tap is just a hair off, and that's also why it doesn't zero out entirely. Um, it's potentially something that I, I can fix. It also gets pulled down, and it definitely goes a lot lower than it, it used to. It would end up stopping at about 2, and with that bleeder resistor in there, it's not a super fast fall. You can see it sort of finishes up at 1.4, but we're talking at that point that's a double A battery. So, but it's a double A battery at 20 amps intermittent. It'd be a, a pretty entertaining battery to have around. Perfect 1.420. Wiggle it down a little bit. I can get it low below, but uh, yeah. Not zero, pretty close. It's not going to give you too bad of a shock unless you lick it. So, I'm going to do some more testing here on the high range. Flip that up, and th this is just a doubler. So, the minimum on this range is twice the minimum on the other. Um, 1.42. So, I'd expect a 1.84, but I, mean, I think it's a little bit below that. Some loss. Not too worried about it. Still pretty close. You're not going to get it below like 2.5 volts with this one. It, something in there has to just be twisted around a little bit because the, you can wiggle it, you can jiggle it, and it just doesn't go lower. It's really struggling to charge at this point. Just completely max that out. So uh, having seen that it, it's not blowing up, I'm going to put in the other bulb here. You can see they're sharing that. And the output voltage jumps quite a bit. Seeing closer to 27.25, 27 and a quarter. Um, and that's about what I would expect considering this design. Post all the schematics, uh, Circuit Sim or Circuit JS simulator. It's great stuff. Whoever wrote that is a genius. And I put this together, and uh, if you feed it 117 to 120 VRMS from the wall, so uh, what is that? 167 peak. It, yeah, I mean you can reproduce this behavior exactly um, down almost to the volt. So this is how the math works out. But uh, I have enough 30 volt power supplies. I don't really need another one. I'm looking at this for the low voltage, high current abilities that it has, and the super dope lava lamp on the front lava-colored lamp. It's not made of lava or melted wax and glitter. It definitely takes a minute, even with both of the bulbs in there, for this to settle. Um, but it's
it's a big capacitor, and it claims 0.3% ripple, which I guess I'd have to see that under load. Need to put a, a significant load under here. I have a USB um, electronic load somewhere with a little fan on it. I don't know if that'll be enough to test this one, so I might have to get a better load. So switch that, because this side is actually technically the unfiltered. The one that you sort of can't see is the filtered. The capacitor is on the filtered side, so they tried to keep those leads short, I think. So you got a, a big fat choke under the transformer here, and then it goes over to the capacitor, and that, that's used to filter everything out. So you measure it through the capacitor, charging up still pretty quickly. I think before I was getting 27 quarter. It'll probably take a minute to get all the way up, but getting pretty close. This old capacitor rubs more of the dust off here. It was definitely 10,000, 25 volt, and uh, I mean, this is, even on the Variac, this is putting out 27 volts. So the 25 volt capacitor was running well over its rated, uh, well, not, not well, two volts over its rated here, and typically more like five or six. And I don't really want to let it do that for a long time, especially if I'm going to be putting some higher amperage loads on it. So this one's rated for 40 volts. Never personally seen it go above 32, so even with spikes and peaks and who's it's and whatnots, that shouldn't be too bad. So turn this off. See it draining pretty quickly now. It's that bleeder resistor across the capacitor. Before it wouldn't do this, it would just sit at 16. And if you came around and when poking your fingers in there, you know, a month later, it would probably still be at 16. It was, that capacitor had teeth. So this is already below a volt, still dropping quickly. Has some noise filtration um, across the line and not yet from line to ground, but it will be doubly filtered in addition to the output capacitor. So yeah, this should make it a pretty robust power supply for quite a few things. Uh, all these switches are just absolutely nasty. There's grease coming off of them while I flip them. You don't even need any solvent, it's just they degrease themselves. They're so greasy. I don't know where this was kept, but uh, it was not a particularly pleasant place. It was either a garage or a kitchen. Maybe a garage kitchen, if that's a thing. I don't want to strip the front down. Um, it just really has this one spot of rust, and otherwise the paint job is fantastic. I love these colors. It's uh, sky blue and navy blue. The camera washes it out a little bit, but it's really nice two-tone. The red shows up really well. Um, everything's in really good shape. It's not really dented. There's just a couple spots of rust, one on the chassis and one on the front. It almost looks like there was a larger fuse holder on there at some point, and there's a bit of tape that says 3M. I don't know if it, if it was at 3M or if it was owned by 3M or it was just someone with some 3M tape. But it's a nice piece. Um, pretty cheap. Got it from the yard sale because the line cord was all weird and it was putting out too much voltage and I didn't think it was worth much, but uh, no, it's in perfect shape. Everything about it is actually really nice and now it has all the parts for the, all the correctly rated parts, so it should last a few years longer. Let's see if I can stuff the front back into the chassis here. So you can pick it up with one hand, um, but it's really unwieldy when that cord gets involved. 
So that thing just starts to get all in the way and yeah, getting it stuffed in here and pulling the cord out. Um, it's not great. Once it's screwed in, it's not an issue. The cord just sort of sticks out the back and everything fits nicely. Um, clean those switches up. Still needs a little bit more of a wipe down on the front and I'm probably going to try and take off that tape and repaint the rusted spots. I've got some enamel paint upstairs. I can definitely mix up a color that will match, at least for those small spots. Put a quick sanding. Fix that up. So now, the last bit of fun, I'll set off the spark from this one. I'm going to boot up the O on power supply. So, this is rated for 25 volts DC, so charge it to 20 and then short it out with my screwdriver. Don't do this at home. Don't do any of this at home and don't mess with line voltage at home unless you know what you're doing, have the appropriate certifications, safety equipment, all of that. Uh, make sure there's someone else around. But just, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. High voltage can kill capacitors can hold the charge for quite a while and I'm intentionally going to charge this one up and put some leads on it get it nice and juicy so you can see what happens but uh, this is a controlled environment I have gloves on I know what voltage is going into this I short it out with an isolated screwdriver These are good heavy alligator clips, not likely to go anywhere. And then, just so I know what's going on here, it's always nice to see what's happening in numbers. More than one place, you know, never trust one measurement, always take two. So fire that up, and you can see it, it just flipped over to constant current, and then it goes back to constant voltage. It only takes a few seconds to get up to 20 volts. The thing really does not take long. I'm sure there's some electrons still working their way into the middle, but yeah, it gets nice and juicy real quick. So I'm going to pull that off, turn off the power supply. And then my meter is starting to drain it. There's not a ton of power in there, so we're down to about 19. Um, it's just some dust coming off. So yeah, I'm going to short this out. Whew. That's a good one. Actually left just a tiny weld spot on my screwdriver. And uh, yeah, leave it on the screwdriver, not on your finger. Screwdrivers can't feel pain. And this one, like I mentioned, the, the dielectric wandering, whatever the term is, you have to recharge it multiple times because it will go right back up to two, two and a half volts. Um, It'll light up a, a small LED. It's definitely not one that you want to leave unsupervised. So, climbing pretty quickly there. If I let it sit, it'll just keep going. The sudden discharge really does not discharge the center of the capacitor. It doesn't get to the core. You have to hold the screwdriver there, and, and really, like, you have to make sure you're in contact with both posts for quite a few seconds it will then finally discharge. So yeah, swap this out, charge it up, set off a nice spark. Um, nothing more in there, no more fun to be had. Just a lot of old dust, so hope you enjoyed watching. This is a a rough process recording this, but got something halfway decent out of it, I hope, and got a good power supply. So, see y'all later.